Thank you, choir. That song, that song has come to be so meaningful for this place of these last few years. It has become, I think, characteristic of what Mount Bethel is all about. That this is a place that God chooses to use to bless generation after generation after generation with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? And today it is my great privilege for a final time to proclaim that gospel to you and we're gonna be looking at Romans chapter eight, reading verses 18 through 24 if you wanna go ahead and turn there. But before we pivot and I start to proclaim that good news in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are a few things that need to be said. And I'm gonna say them. So I'm like a guest preacher today. I don't have to worry about getting invited back. I can do whatever I want. So I can be pretty dangerous, unpredictable. Now, the first thing that I wanna say is thank you. Thank you. For the last 20 years, this has been home. Even though we may have gone far afield to Kentucky, to Rome, Georgia, this has been our home. When Lindy and I came here in 2003 for the first time, we thought that we were gonna be here forever. I remember talking about buying an, a niche in the columbarium. When we left here in 2011 to go to seminary, we knew that we would never be back. <laughs> when we came back in the summer of 2018, we had no idea exactly what God had in store for the next five years. And so as I stand here before you, I don't really know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future. And I know that God has called this place to do great things and to magnify his name in great ways. And so today I wanna charge you with that to whom much is given, much is expected. In Mount Bethel, you gotta know that you have been given so much by your God. Be worthy, be worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So as I say thank you and I love you, I wanna do one thing real quick. If y'all will stand up and y'all squeeze in, I wanna make sure that we get, there we go, all right, all right. Oh wait, there's one other thing I need to say. So as you may have already figured out, and if you didn't previously, you have in the last couple of days, Tombstone is one of our favorite movies around here. It is a modern day classic considered by many to not only be one of the greatest Westerns of all time, but one of the greatest movies of all time. Because although it uses that genre of the Old West, it really at its heart isn't a Western. It's not an action adventure movie. At its heart, it's a movie about friendship. It's a movie, a story about the bond between these two men, Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. There's a scene near the end of the film when Wyatt and Doc and others they've deputized as U.S. Marshals are pursuing this band of outlaws called the Cowboys. And after one particularly miraculous gunfight, one of the other deputy marshals turns to Doc, who's in the late stages of tuberculosis. And they say, Doc, you should be in a hospital. What are you doing here? Why are you doing this? And Doc leaned up against the log, just very flatly, very plainly, very calmly states, Wyatt Earp is my friend. Over the last couple of years, there are a number of people who had asked me, Jonathan, why are you doing this? Why are you sacrificing and risking so much of what you've worked for and so much of your family's future? Well, first and foremost, because it was the right thing to do. It was the moral thing to do. It was the ethical thing to do. It was true. But there were opportunities to maybe not lie, but it at least not lie, but live in integrity 
in an easier way, to take an easier path and to go a different way. And you may say, well, Jonathan, why didn't you do that? For one simple reason. Jody Ray is my friend. When Wyatt Earp came to Tombstone, he had been a lawman in Dodge City and all he really wanted was to put that past behind him. He wanted to live in peace and raise a family, but that wasn't his lot. That wasn't his vocation, his calling. And there's a scene when he finally accepts this and realizes that something must be done, somebody must do it, and he's the one. And if you've seen the movie, you remember, he goes to the top drawer of his bedroom bureau and he opens it. And he pulls out an 1868 Colt Navy Frontier Bunt Line. It's a really long barreled six shooter with a plaque in the handle that's inscribed to Wyatt Earp Peacemaker from the grateful people of Dodge City to mark the event of where he stood and he protected their community. And he stood between them and chaos. And it was something they gave to him as a gift to remember. Well, Jody, I felt like that there needed to be some kind of marker, something to remember the time that we stormed the gates of hell. And as Christ our Lord said, they would not prevail against his church. And so I want you to come up. And I want to give you this. think we're supposed to have guns in the church. Well, <laughs> so just for, yeah, for everybody, this is a replica. It is non-functioning. It is only for display purposes. It will not work if you try. So, and, and you know, I'm convinced that if, uh, if, if the Apostle Paul was writing Ephesians during the 1800s, rather than the sword of the Spirit, he would have said the six-shooter of the Spirit. <laughs> for our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and all the rulers of this world. But I wanted there to be something that you could have that you could look at every day and you would remember the adventure that we live together. So while you're standing, Let's turn to the real reason that we're here and turn with me to the book of Romans. We're going to look again in chapter 8, we'll be reading from verses 18 through 24 to start. Hear God's word. For I consider all the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself also may be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan from within waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he has already seen? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Today's sermon is entitled, The End is Really the Beginning. And so fittingly, I'm going to begin at the end and work backwards. We're going to begin talking about the end of all things, but that word, that English word end, just doesn't really carry a lot of freight. We hear that word and it really 
just doesn't go quite far enough to help us understand what we're talking about here. In the Greek, the word is telos. Telos does mean the point marking the end of a duration, but it also means the last part of the process, through to the very last. It also means the goal toward which a movement is being directed, the outcome, the target at which one aims. In other words, the end is not merely the cessation of things, it is the purpose for the entire effort, the pathway that is walked to arrive there, the process that by which we walk it and the prize that we attain through that effort. When we think about the end towards which we are all headed, the thing that gives our lives, our very existence, purpose and meaning, If we're going to set out on a journey of life, I want to suggest two things to you about that. Number one, you should know what that purpose is. And number two, it should be something worthy of a life's work and effort. Do you hear me today? If you're going to set out on a journey of life towards a telos, then you better know what it is that you're journeying towards, and it better be something that's worth all of your life's effort. What the scripture is telling us here is that all things, all of creation is headed towards a divinely ordained telos, a divinely ordered purpose and end. And that the entirety of creation, we, humanity, are privileged to hold a special place, not only in the completion, but in the process of arriving at that future such that the human experience is defined by the word hope. We have hope because of the divinely ordained telos that God has set before us. What this scripture and others in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament actually tell us is that this is clearly revealed that the future is physical. The future is physical. What do I mean by that? That's to say that it is not some ethereal, esoteric future floating around in the shadow realms. It is real. It is as real as what you are experiencing right now. Perhaps actually even more so. See, Christ was born physically. He was crucified physically. He was resurrected physically. He ascended physically and he will return physically. And as he is now, so we shall be. Why does that matter? Because sometimes I think we think about heaven as this place floating around on clouds with angels and see-through spirits. It's a place that we know we ought to want to go, but if we're being perfectly honest with ourselves, very few of us really want to see it. it. It sounds better than the alternative. Go ahead. We can be honest. But, but I want you to think about your conception of heaven to this morning. I want to ask you, is that conception of heaven, that image and that idea of what you think of as heaven, is it something that you would be willing to give up your life for? Is it something you'd be willing to give up your family for? Is it something you'd be willing to give up every single experience, every single possession, every single act that you have ever done or ever will do or could do? Would you give up everything for that? See, I I think that we think that heaven is great. It sounds good. It's like like, um, the country singer Joe Diffie said, you know, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go tonight. And so we want to, you know, live while we can, get what we can while we can, make hay while the sun shines, enjoy it the best we can before we have to go on and sing hymns and string harps forever and ever. Like I said, it's better than the alternative, but but what what, what changed the game for me was when I realized that heaven is great but it's not the end of the world. 
Heaven is great, but it's not the end of the world. Heaven is merely this. It's the place where God dwells. It is paradise. It is wonderful. It is perfect. It is the freedom from all sin, all sickness, all pain, all suffering, all fault. But heaven is just a word we use to describe where God is. And the end of all things, the telos through which it is, to which we are moving is not heaven. It's that heaven comes back to earth. It's that God is redeeming all of creation. As Paul says here in chapter 8, all of creation is groaning in anticipation because it has been subjected, subjected to suffering. Why? Because of human sin. Human sin broke the system. It created tornadoes and tidal waves, hurricanes and heart attacks, cancer. All of those things are an outgrowth of the breaking of the system that was good when God created it, but that was ruined when humans sinned. And God is setting about to put all of that back to where it's supposed to be in all of creation is groaning in anticipation. You see, what we have to look forward to is a world that is as real, if not more so, than the one that we're sitting in here today. And what that means, church, what that means, beloved, is that there is a new economy coming. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. And because Christ is risen, that new creation has already begun breaking in. We might say we're in the end game right now. We're in the final push as all is being remade and the old economy is being pushed out by the new economy, God's economy. That word economy comes from the Greek. It's the, the word oikonomia. And oikonomia means the management of a household. The management or structure of something, the governance of. See, Jesus is alive, Christ is risen, and as we might say, there's a new sheriff in town. Because the old oikonomia that's built on a self-centered, selfish motivation that is built on things that don't last is passing away, and that eternal kingdom that is God-directed, is coming in. But don't be deceived. It is not a pie-in-the-sky, sweet by-and-by idea in the head. It is real. It's for you. It's for me. And it matters. I've preached on this before that because Christ was incarnated, because he was physically resurrected, because he physically ascended and physically is returning, it means that matter matters to God. He is reclaiming and restoring what he created as good, but it's different. It's perfect. This week, the church lost a giant, the death of Tim Keller. He's a pastor, an author, a church planner, one of the founders of the Gospel Coalition, a director of a global church network, a theologian, an incredibly godly and humble man. There was an excerpt from his book, Every Good Endeavor, that was shared by Good News Magazine. I highly recommend that you read both that in its entirety and Every Good Endeavor in its entirety. Tim Keller expresses this so much more poignantly than I could. He says that we are not to choose jobs and conduct our work to fulfill ourselves and accrue power for being called by God to do something is empowering enough. Notice something counterintuitive. If the point of work is to serve and exalt ourselves, then our work inevitably becomes less about the work and more about us. While ancient monks may have sought salvation through religious works, many modern people seek a kind of salvation, self-esteem and self-worth from career success. This leads us to seek only high-paying, high-status jobs and to worship them in perverse ways. But the gospel frees us from the relentless pressure of having to prove ourselves and secure our identity through work for we are already proven and secure. It also frees us from a condescending attitude toward less sophisticated labor and from envy 
over more exalted work. When we talk about this world passing away, one of two things happens. Either we, we determine that um, nothing in this world, it's, it doesn't matter because it's all gonna burn anyway, and so we need to be focused on spiritual things and only the spiritual. Or we fall off the horse on the other side and we say, well, because this world's passing away, like I said earlier, I better get what I can while I can before I have to go to heaven. Before I have to go to heaven, right? But what Keller is trying to help us see is that no, because heaven and earth are coming together, because Christ is risen and that reality is already breaking in, we as the church, we as the redeemed, we who are the first fruits, who have the Spirit, are supposed to live by the Spirit, as Paul says earlier in chapter 8. And what that means is not that we abandon our professions. In fact, Keller, Keller quotes uh, St. Augustine in this, in this book where he talks about the, the um, one of the errors uh, that, that, that was being made was that the, the clergy somehow believed, and the people believed that somehow what the clergy did was of a higher spiritual value, when in reality, it is those of us who live and work day in and day out as teachers, as nurses, as attorneys, as accountants, as salespeople, as developers, as employees, the work that we do can have an infinitely greater impact if, if it is done for the glory of God, if it's done with the why being the eternal kingdom of God rather than the glorification of self. See, if we're finding our identity and our status and our self-worth in that rather than in Christ, then we're building a false identity. We're building a false God. When we're young, we want to be valued for our contribution, don't we? When we start out in our careers, we want to be valued for our contribution. But as we grow wiser, not necessarily older, but when we grow wiser, we want to be cherished for who we are. So the question is, who are you? Who are you? And who are you becoming? Are you becoming more like yourself as God created you to be? Are you becoming more like the distorted version of humanity that this world with all of its brokenness perpetuates? See, we can only be who we were created to be when we are living in Christ. Our friend Dave Rhodes says, if you don't know who you are called to be, who God has called you to be, if you don't know who God has called you to be, you'll become whatever someone pays you to do. Friends, that's a form of slavery. And we have not been set free in Christ to return back to that kind of slavery. So how do we live free? How do we do that, Jonathan? Practically, day in and day out, in whatever role we fill, well, it's simply this, tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth in everything you say and everything you do. Tell the truth, live the truth. Don't live your truth. It's not your truth, it's the truth. Live the truth. Live a life that tells the truth with everything that you say and everything that you do because telling the truth is the most powerful, dangerous, and rewarding thing that you can do, I promise you. This is how you live a life that matters. Your patterns of living shape who you are becoming and telling the truth becomes habitual. It becomes a habit. And guess what? The more you tell the truth, the more powerful you become because you are freed from the lies of who you are not. You're freed from the lies of who these false identities wanna tell you to be and you no longer have to serve those masters. You no longer dance to those tunes. You step fully into who God has said you are when you tell the truth. But the opposite is also true. Lying, deceit becomes habitual. The more you lie, the more you deceive yourself and others, the easier it becomes and the harder it becomes to begin to tell the truth. 
because you've begun to stand on a life that the acknowledgement of the truth will completely unravel. So we've heard before probably this, you know, the idea, this concept that the truth, that, uh, that, that one lie can destroy an entire life. It can destroy an entire career. It can tear apart a marriage. It can destroy a family. But I think in thinking of it in that way, we elevate and give far too much power to lies. The truth is infinitely more powerful. I want you to think of it this way, is that when we build our life on lies, not, not the big, malicious, spiteful, malevolent lies, but the little lies, the little deceptions that we tell ourselves, the false identities, the facades, the fronts that compose most of our lives, especially in a place that prides itself on appearances, the worst deceptions are those that we perpetrate on ourselves. But when we build that, when we build a life and we weave a web of lies, when it comes into contact with the truth, guess what happens? It comes unraveled. And the truth is infinitely more powerful than deception. This is why when Isaiah has his vision of God in the temple in Isaiah chapter six, he says, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm unraveled. That's what it means. Because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's like Isaiah, when we come face to face with that truth, there's often times that we want to run. It can be hard, but it's also the only way to freedom. And the more you tell the truth, the more you become an agent of truth, the more your life embodies the truth, the more dangerous you're gonna to become to the lies that people tell themselves. So just get ready. Just get ready. So how do we begin to unravel the web of lies that we weave around our lives? How do we begin to tell the truth and become more and more who we were created to be? We begin by telling the greatest truth that we could ever tell. And the greatest truth has two parts. One, I'm broken, sinful, depraved, and I'm helpless to do anything about it. And two, Jesus Christ is the only way that I can be restored to what I was actually created to be. See, to tell the truth, you gotta know the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. But even in John 1:14, it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. As John read today in chapter 16, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And Jesus promises in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the incarnation of the truth, the embodiment of the truth. And if we are in Christ, then our lives must incarnate the truth. We cannot say that we are followers of Christ. We cannot say that we have stepped into that eternal kingdom, that oikonomia, of God's eternal kingdom that is sweeping away what was, we can't say that we are in that if the truth is not in us, if we are not living that truth, telling that truth, if we are denying it, if we are weaving a web of lies to create our identity, we're not able to step into that. But it's this simple, it's this simple. Tell the greatest truth. I'm a sinner, 
I need a savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. See, in Numbers chapter 21, you remember the story of the children of Israel are being led in the wilderness by Moses and once again, they, they turn and they grumble and they rebel against God and they're disobedient to God. And what does God do? He sends poisonous vipers among them. And those vipers begin to bite the heels and people are dying and it is a painful death. They lay there in agonizing pain and they begin to die. And finally, the people come to Moses and they say, we've had enough. Tell God, we're sorry. Ask him to fix this. And God tells Moses what? Fashion a bronze serpent, put it on a stick and hold it up high. And anyone who looks at the serpent will be healed. It's kind of a weird story, isn't it? And we know if we've gone to Sunday school and vacation Bible school, we go, oh, well, that's Jesus, right? Put Jesus up on, and yes, that's right. That's a foreshadowing of Jesus. Look to Jesus, look to the cross, and you'll be healed. But why? Why? Why do we have to look to the cross? Why did they have to look to the bronze serpent? Those poisonous vipers were the physical manifestation of the sin that they had committed. It was the consequence of their own sinfulness that they were reaping. It was the harvest that they had sown. And the only way for them to be delivered and to be healed was to turn and face it. They couldn't ignore it. They couldn't deny it. They had to turn and they had to look it square in the eyes and say, I did that. It's my fault. I can't fix it. And when Jesus hung on that cross, he took on him the sin of the world, your sin and my sin, and the only way that we can receive forgiveness and healing is to look him square in the eye and see every line on his tortured face and to say, that's mine, I did that, I can't fix it. And until we're willing to own it and acknowledge it, there is nothing that can be done. As long as we live in denial. But when we do, when you confess and repent, the work is finished. It is finished. It has been done. The future is physical. It's as real as what you're experiencing right now, if not more so. There's a new economy that is sweeping away the broken economy. And the only way to live in it is to tell the truth, to live and incarnate the truth that is Jesus Christ. If you do that, I promise, you will live an adventure. You will have power and excitement and you'll be dangerous. But there's a reward. There is a hope of resurrection. It all begins when we're willing to lay down those little fictions and fibs, those little lies, and embrace the truth of Christ and his salvation. So I want to ask you to do something for me right now. Let's all bow our heads. I want us each to consider how are we deceiving ourselves today? What fictions and fabrications do we have for our own comfort? And what are the lies that we tell others to maintain that? I want to ask, ask yourself this question. Am I willing to encounter the truth of Jesus Christ? Am I willing to face my own brokenness and receive the fullness, power, and reward that comes from telling the truth? Am I willing to allow him to unravel what I've created so that I can receive what he has ordained? Now, Mount Bethel, as a community, I want you to hear me. God has placed a great calling upon your shoulders. But you can't live into that calling if you don't tell the truth, if you don't live the truth, if you're not willing to daily lay down and acknowledge your own brokenness and dependence on him, both as individuals and as a community. But I want to ask you to do one last thing. Imagine with me 
If telling the truth, if letting go of the little lies that we tell ourselves and telling the truth of Jesus Christ in every ordinary, mundane task and conversation, if that brings power and freedom, imagine the power of an entire church full of truth tellers. And that's the charge that I lay on you today as I say thank you and farewell. God bless. Amen.